welcome. Welcome to everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kate Miller, and I'm a reference librarian in the music division. Uh, and we're all here to celebrate someone's very special birthday, and that is Clara Schumann and her big 200 that we celebrated back in September. Um, now, I wanted to just get a quick show of hands. Uh, we had a few, we've had a few events this weekend to celebrate Clara Schumann. Did anyone come to the film on Thursday night? We have, one, okay, one. Uh, did anyone come to last night's concert? A couple, a, a few, okay. So for a lot of us, this is the only event we're coming to. Am I okay? My earring. Well, if anybody is friends with me or works with me, you know I'm not gonna leave one earring on because fashion's just too important. So, okay, so uh, so most of us, this is our only Clara Schumann event we're, we're coming to this weekend, and that's great, you picked a really good one because you're coming to hear me. And uh, it's a really good one because we're bringing out special uh, materials from the collections that showcase Clara's work, her career, uh, and her relationships throughout her life. So I just wanted to say a quick word about um, how I met Clara Schumann personally. So I first met Clara when I was studying piano uh, in high school. This is about um, 20 years ago, we're talking about. And I was preparing for a local competition featuring, you had to pick a work by a woman composer. So I remember my piano teacher gave me a book. It was an anthology of works by women. And I can remember it. It's white cover. It's red letters, women composers, kind of a sketch of a woman's face on the front. And um, I played multiple pieces from the book. But one of the pieces that I learned from that anthology was Clara Schumann's Mazurka in G major, which for those few of you who were here last night was played on the program. I did not play it nearly so fantastically as Anne-Marie McDermott did last night. But um, that was how I met Clara Schumann, and I liked the piece well enough. Um, but then I went to college, and I studied music history. I did not think I would be a music major, but inevitably I ended up in the music major. Um, and I was in my music history classes, and I sort of had this continuing interest in women composers and I found myself returning to Clara Schumann uh, as I took voice lessons. And uh, I happened to listen to, and I forgot to, to start my PowerPoint for our weekend of Clara Schumann. Um, I checked out a CD from our music library in, in my college, and that CD was um, this one called Schumann Leader. Uh, it's Barbara Bonney's the singer, and Vladimir Ashkenazi is the pianist. And I met Clara in high school, but this is when I fell in love with Clara in college. I listened to the leader on this, comp on this uh, CD, and it includes leader by both Robert and Clara Schumann. And I was in love, and I automatically went to my library, and I found a... Uh, uh, a 1990 publication of, of two volumes of her leader, took them to my voice teacher and said, I want to sing these. And so I started programming them on some of my voice recitals in college. Then I went to graduate school. Um, I studied uh, musicology at Catholic University. And I, I, I wanted to continue this trajectory of, of focusing on women composers. But honestly, when I went to uh, my graduate program, I was kind of nervous to focus on Clara because it seemed a little bit like a cop-out to me, right? I wanted, I wanted to pursue feminist musicology. I want to study women composers and bring these unknown stories to life. So I'm going to focus on maybe the one of two women that people actually do know about from music history. So I, I kind of tried to avoid Clara. But then I took, one of my first classes was a research methodology course where your job is to chart the kind of trends of, uh, of, of research on a person or a topic. And 
for that purpose, I mean, Clara actually was a really good person because there was some research on her that I could chart. So I returned to Clara. And then I took a seminar on Robert Schumann's song cycles. <laughs> and uh, it was a wonderful seminar. It's one of my favorite genres. And uh, the final ass paper assignment, I could pick any song cycle that I wanted to pick to analyze and really uh, you know, sort of get my hands on whether it was really a song cycle or whether it was really just a collection of songs. That's another declassified that we can talk about for a future year. But um, so when I found out that Clara and Robert had co-authored a song cycle uh, with uh, Friedrich Rückert's leader, or his poetry, uh, called their Liebesfrühling cycle, um, which I will point out later, and we do have a first edition copy of on the table out here. I was immediately mesmerized, and I wanted to study that. So I, I just keep coming back to Clara throughout my life, and my uh, passion for her really has never subsided. So it was really, I've been looking forward to this weekend for quite a while. Um, what I'm thinking, because I'm thinking some of you are coming in today knowing some about Clara's life, maybe her music. Some of you have no idea what, uh, who this person is or what her place in music history is. So what I want to do is just sort of walk through her life and the circumstances of her life with you. We'll keep it kind of informal. I'll talk a little bit about that, um, and then I'll sort of feel you out for where we're going to go with the conversation. I want to leave some open time, too, where you can ask questions and we can sort of take this conversation um, where you're most interested. And then, of course, I'll also come down and walk through what I've pulled from our collections uh, and, and what stories are being told on the table in front of me and, and give you time to come up and take a closer look yourself, too. So. With that, to tell Clara's story, I think it helps to start at the very beginning, which is like before Clara's here. So let's start with her parents because her father is a really big part of Clara's story. Um, we are dealing with uh, Friedrich Wieck here, and you can see a portrait of him. This is Clara's father. And um, does anybody, I mean, feel free to shout out if you, does anybody have a uh, knowledge of, of what they think of Friedrich Wieck? What was he? I see, I see somebody strict, right? Yes, Friedrich Wieck was strict. He laid the hammer down. Um, Friedrich, he, was, he ran a piano store in Leipzig, Germany, and that's where Clara's born. Um, and he not only sold pianos there, but he taught piano as well. Now, interestingly, Friedrich actually came to music pretty late in his life. Um, we're not entirely sure where he got his, his real education from. Uh, he was interested in theology, actually, in his teens and was kind of planning to go into the ministry, um, but then I don't know, got off course at some point. What we do know is that by 1815, he, was, he had written his own music, and he was actually sending copies of his music to Carl Maria von Weber who was a very big deal composer, to get feedback. And what was interesting to me when I read this part, um, when I read about this, was that, uh, so Carl Maria von Weber, he did give feedback, he published a review, and uh, there, are a f there are a few, one or a few nice things he said, or encouraging things he said about the music, also criticisms of the music. Now, when I love listening to podcasts and interviews, and when I listen to interviews with artists, actors, uh, musicians these days, I constantly hear people saying that they if they listen to the reviews, they could get 99 good reviews, and if they get one bad review, that is the only review that's going to stick in their mind, and it weighs on them, and it's just they can't take, they can't take the criticism. But Friedrich, I guess, got these negative reviews, but got this little bit of encouraging um, encouragement uh, from Weber and decided to run with it. So he really had a different outlook on life, which I thought was kind of fun um, or funny. So uh, 
so he starts to learn music and, and focus on that. He also became a private tutor uh, in the homes of wealthy families and really uh, developed a keen understanding and mastery of the psychology of education and teaching. So he was really sort of um, marrying these two interests and talents of his um, by the time he gets to Leipzig and opens up the shop and starts teaching piano. Um, okay, so then when Friedrich is 31 years old, in 1816, he marries one of his students, Marianne Tromlitz. So uh, Marianne was 19 when they married, and this is indeed Clara's mom. And uh, Marianne was a really talented, well-regarded pianist and singer. She performed regularly at the Leipzig Gewandhaus. And so Friedrich marrying Marianne was really helpful for his aspirations and his career because her success reflected well on him. And we'll see that that dynamic continue later on when Clara comes into the picture. Um, actually, it was in the, the, the piano teaching business, she played a part in it because she would actually work with Friedrich's more advanced piano students because she was technically much more proficient than Friedrich was. Um, so they have, they have five children. Clara is the oldest surviving child. One, one girl comes before Clara, but she doesn't survive. Um, but Clara is essentially the oldest, um, and she has two brothers, um, Alvin and Gustav, and an, another younger brother who also died um, uh, really young. But after giving birth to Victor, the last of their five children, um, Marianne left Friedrich. She had it with him. Uh, as we said, so Friedrich could be a very difficult, he was a very, very difficult person. He was really strict, he was rigorous, he had high demands. Um, Marianne, Marianne left and she went to go live with her father, um, wanted a divorce. So Friedrich said, okay, well you can keep Clara until her fifth birthday, um, but Marianne really didn't have rights over Clara. Uh, at that time, so it was sort of like he allowed her to have Clara uh, live with her until she was five. Um, but after that, um, Clara was to go back to Friedrich and live with him and, and uh, stay with him. So the two officially divorced in 1825, so Clara's six years old, and Marianne remarries. She actually, she marries her new husband. His name is Adolf Bargill, who was an, a colleague of Friedrich Wieck's. He's another piano teacher. So that must have stung a little bit. Um, they moved to Berlin at some point, um, or not long after they marry. And I think, I'm a vi very visual person. I think maps help. So I wanted to point out that um, we're talking about Leipzig here uh, in the east, uh, and you can see Berlin is north of Leipzig there. Leipzig is the major, it is a major music center of Germany. Uh, so it's a very good place for Friedrich to have established himself and a great place for Clara to have been born and, and been raised. So, um, so Marianne remarried. Friedrich also remarried a little bit later. Um, so until he remarried, all of his focus lied on Clara. Who else but her? Um, she was the oldest, and she uh, her proficiencies were not in great balance. Uh, I constantly find examples of this when I study, um, you know, child prodigies. Uh, they, they have great gifts in some regards, um, in this case music, but in terms of maybe uh, speech development or other parts of emotional development, um, they're dealing with, with some stunted development there. And Clara is one of those uh, examples. Her speech and verbal communication were way behind, um, but music came very naturally to her. And of course, her father pushed her 
as well because he always wanted her to be a virtuosa and he was going to train her to do so. Um, when she was, uh, so when Clara is about nine years old, Friedrich does remarry. Um, he remarries uh, a woman named Clementine Trogott. And uh, at this point, his business is doing really well and to the point so he can go touring with his young Clara and uh, sort of be the stage father for her, set up this touring uh, schedule so that she can start developing a reputation. And they would be away for long periods of time. Uh, so Clementine was essential because she actually helped him keep the business running and kept the household in order as well. Together, Friedrich and um, Clementine had three children, one of whom was, some, was, was successful, I'll say. Her name was Marie Wieck. So this is Clara's half-sister. Um, Marie, he, Friedrich really tried to train Marie to be like another Clara. And she was successful. She was a, a great pianist, but never achieved the heights that Clara did. Um, you know, we... We're not programming Marie Vick on uh, last night's program or anything like that. Um, so, and they, Clara and Marie do maintain a connection as they get older um, and, and are, are friendly with each other. So, as I said before, um, when Clara was five, she returned to live with Friedrich. And uh, she was forced to separate from her mother. I think that's a really important part of her biography to keep in mind when you're five years old. This is like the time when traumas can really sort of leave lasting impacts on you. And uh, so she was forced to be separated from her mother at a really early age. Um, and Friedrich's lesson plans were rigorous, as I said. So by the time she was seven years old, he had her playing piano for three hours every day one of those hours was a lesson, and two of those hours were practice. So think of any seven-year-olds you know, and if you could make them play an instrument for three hours a day. Um, all the while, I mean, he was intent on molding the next piano virtuosa, so that meant um, arranging for certain types of lessons for Clara, which included French and English lessons, because she needed to be able to tour, so she needed to be able to communicate with everybody on the touring, theory and harmony lessons, composition lessons, counterpoint lessons, orchestration lessons, voice lessons, and even violin lessons. So this is a busy little girl. And at nine years old, she first performed at the Leipzig Gewandhaus, the major music hall in Leipzig, and to great reviews. Uh, at 11 years old, she traveled to Dresden to perform publicly, um, for the, and that was the, her first time performing outside the comfort of the Leipzig uh, musical circle that she knew. Um, and that year, she was also preparing for her first all-solo concert in Leipzig, so all Clara, all her. Um, but this is 1830, she's 11 years old, and it's the same year that another big change happens in the Wieck household they have a new student who comes to board with them, and that student is Robert Schumann, yes. So Robert arrives in Leipzig. Um, so Robert, ah, and let me just show some pictures too that I meant to show. These are young pictures of Clara. I took a lot of these from um, the Robert Schumann house in Zwickau, it is a museum, it's also a concert hall, they have an archive there, and they have a fantastic website um, with access to uh, photographs and such from their collections. So I took a lot of these photos from that website, which I recommend if you're interested in, in looking at more. So we have an eight-year-old Clara and then kind of a teenage Clara in the other two pictures. So um, Robert arrives. And he's, and I said there was 1830, so the picture, the color picture that you see, that is what we can assume Robert looked like when he arrived at the Wieck household. Um, he had come from the university in Heidelberg where he was studying law. 
he had no interest in law once he got there uh, and decided that his real passion was music. So he wrote to his mother and tried to convince his mother to be okay with him studying music. And he knew about Friedrich Wieck, who had this great reputation for teaching, and he wanted to go study with Friedrich Wieck. So he wrote to Wieck, and Wieck had to write with uh, Robert Schumann's mother and convince her that, uh, that Robert might have promise and there might be uh, something of a performance career in store for him if he could get through to him through his teaching. So uh, luckily, she, they succeed. Robert comes and, and lives with the family and studies with them alongside a 12-year-old Clara Schumann. Um, so they would study together, and they would have lessons, and they were both under Friedrich's watch. And this was both, as you can probably imagine, 20-year-old coming to study with a 12-year-old child genius um, who is getting every piece of her father's attention. It's both inspiring and also maddening, right? Wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be kind of annoyed at times <laughs> when this... You're, you're trying to, to master something, and this 12-year-old is just kind of excelling at a pace that you can't always keep up with. So that was something that Robert had to contend with when he was studying there as well. And then at a certain point, as the decade goes on, Robert's aspirations turn away from performance um, toward composition and focusing on that. He has a hand injury which doesn't allow him to really excel at performance. Um, but luckily, there's this girl who's really good in this house with him. So he, she can go and perform all of his exciting compositions that he's writing, which uh, works out for him. So he brought his second published work, Papillon, to uh, Friedrich Wieck after he, he published it. Um, and Wieck was so excited by it and he, uh, that he gave it to Clara immediately and was encouraging her to play it. Um, Wieck was, you know, was a fan of Robert at this point in time. But as a teenager, you know, she was 12 when he arrived and years go on and little Clara is getting a, a bit older and um, uh, she's also writing music, I should say, at this time, too. Robert's not the only one who's writing music. At 13 years old, she started writing her piano concerto in A minor um, and completed it weeks before her 16th birthday. So um, she's already uh, working hard on, or not work, she's already at work on her compositional output, too. But as I said, she's becoming a teenager, and this is a time when big feelings tend to develop, uh, especially if you're living in a house with one kind of youngish guy <laughs> who shares an interest in music with you. And I do mean those kind of Twitter-pated feelings are beginning to develop. Uh, in an 1882 biography of Robert Schumann, um, there's a sentence that says, as far as we know, a special affection was, was apparent first in the spring of 1836. Now, a kind of interesting little tidbit is that in a, a Schumann family copy of that biography, uh, Clara actually went back and wrote in the margin, um, no, already in 1833. So she, she's correcting uh, the timeline. So Clara identifies a shift in her feelings by the time she was 14, um, at which point Robert would have been 23. Um, we do know, <laughs> we do know because of my um, weird interest or <laughs> weir weird research into this, that they shared their first kiss after uh, Clara's 16th birthday. Um, and then when Friedrich came to understand what was brewing here, what was developing between Clara and Robert, he was not pleased, um, and his feelings do not really budge. So throughout her late teens, Clara and Robert arranged secret correspondence and secret meetings, um, but this 
you know, I, I should, what I wanted to point out um, is that this courtship is it's it's more than just a romantic whirlwind where you know with star-crossed lovers that cannot be stopped. Um, it's a really confusing time for Clara, and she's constantly dealing with the push and pull because not only is she in love with Robert, um, but she is totally dedicated and attached to her father, uh, Friedrich, even though he's difficult and he's strict and he's kind of an easy villain to paint in this picture or in this story. He also is the, he gave her all her resources and is the reason that she was who she was and that she could do what she did. And she was well aware of that. And he would say things to her like, he's not going to be able to provide for you. Friedrich managed all of her finances um, and he kept all of them too <laughs> um, as her manager. Uh, and she didn't have rights to any of that, of the, the money that she was making in her performance career. Uh, so this was, it was actually very tough for Clara and she expresses doubt and even sort of tests Robert Schumann at times saying, I don't know if you can really provide for me or like think about this, can you really give me what I want, what I need? Um, but uh, eventually, of course, they, they do wind up together. Um, during the winter of 1837 to 1838, Wieck traveled uh, with Clara to Vienna, and she gathered acclaim and financial success, and Friedrich Wieck was so happy. This was like one of his great, <laughs> one of his great successes. Um, and it was so successful that Clara even received an imperial honor from Ferdinand the, the I in Austria, which was like the highest honor that you could receive as a musician in Austria. Then the following year in 1839, um, as tensions are mounting with this whole triangle that's forming between her father and Robert, Clara travels um, without her father for the first time to tour in, um, in Paris. And so she's forced to fend for herself and schedule her own concerts and everything. Um, and in fact, we do have a letter on display that I will point out again later um, that she writes during this time when she's in Paris and it's signed, this is before she marries Schumann, so it's signed Clara Wieck. And it's actually very rare to find letters um, that, she, that are signed from before her marriage. And we just acquired that in the last couple, uh, last year or two. So um, I will point that out again when I, when I come down to walk through the display. And when Friedrich read reviews of Clara's performances and saw that she was doing really well in Paris, he was mm, bitter. <laughs> he was not really excited about it. Um, so he wrote to one of her friends that he intended to take, her, uh, take away her inheritance and withhold all of her earned money uh, unless she gave up the idea of being with Robert. So here is where the start of um, threats of lawsuits enters the picture too. Um, when Clara returned to Leipzig later in 1839, she was not welcome at her father's house and ultimately she left to live with her mother in Berlin. So Wieck presents Robert Schumann with a declaration in court in December 1839 listing the many reasons why Schumann was totally unfit to marry his daughter, including the assertion that he did not really love Clara, he wanted to use her for his own purposes and live off the money she earned as an artist, which is a little rich. You know? <laughs> um, um, so Robert Schumann sues Friedrich Wieck in turn about half a year later, charging him with slander and calling for repayment of the money Clara had earned on tour. They settled the money out of court, but Schumann won the slander charges and Wieck was forced to pay court expenses and more to Schumann. And this just enraged him all the more, of course, prompting him to continue a smear campaign against both his daughter and Robert. And uh, he spread lies that his daughter was destitute, maligned her career and character. Um, I, I had to laugh a little bit when I read this one quote from 
Nancy Reich's amazing biography of, of Clara Schumann uh, when she said, the foulest blow was his declaration that she was not playing well and would ruin any piano she used. <laughs> you're an alcoholic, you're horrible, <laughs> and you're not playing well. <laughs> so, um, so in September 19, uh, 1839, Clara planned another concert schedule to raise her own dowry to give to Schumann. And um, eventually on um, the eve of Clara's 21st birthday, Robert and Clara do marry. And um, with their new marriage, Clara starts, or Clara and Robert start a marriage diary, um, which they were dedicated to writing in every week. They would alternate who would write in it. Uh, and they would write about their musical journeys, their, you know, what's going on with them, sort of respond to one another. And I, I mentioned that Clara, uh, her verbal and communication skills were kind of stunted early in life. In, when you compare it to her musical skills. Robert Schumann also was, I mean, he was a great writer and a great composer. He was not a great communicator from what I have read. Um, so I think writing in the diary was the most effective means of communication, perhaps, between them as a couple. Um, and it's well known 1840, the year they get married, that's known as Robert's Year of Song, um, where he wrote well over 100 songs um, that are, you know, some people think to be inspired by his impending marriage and the promise of a new beginning. Um, and he writes, I, I, that's how I, that was my in with Clara, in fact, I have to admit, like, I fell in love with Robert's songs first. Um, so when, um, so uh, in terms of the songs, one of my favorite works um, that was featured a little bit in the program last night and which is represented on the table is the song cycle I mentioned earlier, um, their Liebesfrühling cycle based on poems of, uh, or settings of poems by Rückert. And uh, this was made, this was published in 1841, so a year after their, their wedding. Um, but it's interesting because it's called uh, Opus 37 slash 12. So it's Robert's Opus 37, but it's Clara's Opus 12. And it's actually published on the cover, you'll see, as, as 37 slash 12. Um, and it's comprised of, of songs by both composers. And if you read in there, um, I'll read a little bit of an entry in the marriage diary that I just mentioned. Um, this is after, um, this is in January of 1841. So a few months after they get married. He says, the idea to bring out an album of Lieder with Clara has given me enthusiasm for work. Thus, from Monday to Monday the 11th, nine Lieder from the Liebesfrühling by Rückert were completed, in which I think I may have again found a special tone. Now, Clara should also compose a few of the Liebesfrühling. Oh, do it, Clärchen, he says to her. So she responds a week later in the marriage diary, and she says, several times already I've gotten myself to work on the poems of Rückert that Robert had copied, but it simply won't go at all. I have no talent whatsoever for composition. This sort of speaks a little bit to a theme that came up with David's talk and the talk back after the concert last night. The idea, uh, uh, Clara is very self-deprecating, um, belittling of her own work you find in her correspondence and in her diaries. I, I, think it's, um, I think it's actually a really interesting history of women writing about their own work, especially during the 19th century at this time. I find lots of examples of it, not just with Clara. And I sort of wonder, hmm, I sort of wonder if it's more of a protection um, not so much uh, an honest reflection of her feelings. I don't know this. This is all sort of my conjecture and wonderings from it. Um, I wonder if it's almost like um, 
making a meal for someone and saying, is it okay? I don't know. Is it overcooked? I don't know. And you just want, val or what, is she looking for validation or is she really that insecure? I don't know. But it's sort of an interesting thing to think about. Um, but several months later, she returns to the topic of these Liebesfrühling uh, poems and um, writes that she's completed four of the poems for Robert, um, who was ecstatic to receive the compositions on his 31st birthday. This is very common. They give each other compositions on their birthdays and Christmas. It's the go-to present that they have for each other. Um, in secret, Robert arranged to combine three of Clara's settings with nine of his, and he had them set um, and published together as a surprise present for her, like I just said. <laughs> it's, it's like if they can't think of a new present for each other or something. Um, so uh, so that what you'll notice in the, the copy, the first edition copy I have on the table, I have the cover, which is really beautiful, and then I also have it open to one of Clara's songs, um, and you'll notice that it doesn't say next to the title who wrote the song. It's very purposeful. Uh, Robert did not want anyone to know who wrote which songs because it was their combined work. It was, um, you know, born out of their, their shared love for each other. Uh, Liebesfrühling means love spring. And um, actually, if you, if I look into it a lot further, or at, as I have, I sort of wonder if there some. Um, I sort of wonder if they started also putting this together um, around the time that Clara might have known that she was pregnant with her first child. When I look at the dates and I and and everything, um, if you're interested in hearing more about my theories, come up to me after the talk, and I will delight you with more ideas about imagery and stuff in the poetry. Um, so, <laughs> um, okay, now, so they, okay, and speaking of children, Marie is their first child, she's the oldest, um, and in fact, Clara will give birth to eight more children over 13 years, so I think by the time she's 35, she has had eight children, and two miscarriages, in fact. Um, all the while touring <laughs> and performing. So performing through the discomfort of being hugely pregnant, performing through morning sickness, you have to believe. Um, uh, it, it's, it's quite impressive when you take a moment back and think about the whole range of her career and what she was dealing with throughout it. Um, now, at the end of 1844, the family actually moves from Leipzig to Dresden after Robert uh, faces a physical and mental breakdown. So this is kind of the start of the decline for Robert. Many of you might know that in the end, Robert uh, succumbs to mental illness. Um, he winds up in a psychiatric hospital at the end of his life and dies there. Um, this kind of starts uh, in the 1840s. Actually, the real start you can, you can first detect is while they're on tour in Russia. Clara went to Russia, and she, it was like a lifelong dream of her, she, she, and she was just having a ball. She was loving it. Um, but Robert fell ill and was not in a great place, and he never really bounces back from this. So when they got back from Leipzig, they decided to move to Dresden because Dresden, um, partially because it was supposed to be a healthier environment. Um, it was on the river and uh, had mountain air around, which was supposed to be better for health. So that facilitated that move um, in 1844. Um, interestingly, Friedrich Beek, her father, who they had a total break, of course, um, uh, he had also moved to Dresden uh, just a little bit before their marriage. So he was there as well. And um, Clara did have something of a reconciliation with him a little bit after their marriage. 
So perhaps she saw, you know, this idea of Vic being in Dresden. Maybe there would be some potential emotional support there um, since Robert was not at, working at 100%. Um, but my spoiler alert is it does not go that way. <laughs> they, 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 they have another break and it doesn't go well. Now, um, one of the cute things, one of the cute couple things that Robert and Clara would do together, which I think is very sweet, um, aside from writing in this marriage diary, they would actually um, undertake, you know, a, a, a specific musical study together. Um, so one example of that is in 1845, they both decided to study counterpoint together. And uh, Clara never really had a deep passion for fugues, but Robert did describe himself once as being in a fugen passion uh, as they both worked on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As they both studied fugues. And you will notice if you come up to the display table, um, the book that is open, uh, uh, it is actually a musical autograph book that was, um, it's musical autographs by 19th century composers and musicians that a man named William Bradbury kept. Um, he was another composer an American, and went there. So you'll actually see um, that it's signed by Clara in Dresden, and it is one of her fugues um, from this time when she was studying uh, counterpoint with Robert. So that is what she decided to um, sign as her musical autograph in his book. Um, despite his poor health, Robert was really productive in Dresden, and he composes his piano concerto, his C major symphony, and more. Um, when he's really productive, Clara's performance career suffers a bit. Um, you all, I, I bet that was a theme for me uh, following their, both of their lives. So it's like if, if he was doing really well, she was suffering in her performance career. But when her performance career was really at a surge, um, Robert was frustrated and not, not doing quite as well. So there's that push and pull. But she got pregnant five more times uh, while they lived in Dresden. Uh, and uh, she did manage to compose some as well. Um, for example, she wrote her piano trio in 1846, which was on the program last night, um, published it a year later. Um, and notably, um, also during this time, her fourth child and firstborn son, his name was Emil, he was born in Dresden, but died sadly just 16 months after um, he was born, at which time Clara was pregnant again. So uh, it's uh, crazy, <laughs> like, it's just a lot. Um, but at this time, Robert's earning more um, from his publications and his music sales. Um, so he's able to contribute a little bit more to the family income at this point, too. Um, but largely speaking, Clara had to perform because she was the breadwinner for the family. So the 1850s, as Schumann's move to Dusseldorf, after Robert is offered the position of music director at the Municipal Orchestra and Chorus. But unfortunately, this doesn't turn out to be a great fit for Schumann. Um, probably partially because he is not well and he is um, not connecting well with the singers that he has to work with. Um, but Clara, on the other hand, has been welcomed to the city as the, its premier pianist. She performs regularly, um, uh, but Robert's behavior just worsens. He's withdrawn, he suffers attacks similar to strokes and um, even has some auditory hallucinations during this time. He was weak, his conducting was weird, <laughs> and um, he was not getting along so well with the musicians and singers he was conducting, and all, actually he had Clara play the piano when he would rehearse, and oftentimes she would have to step in and sort of um, translate <laughs> or communicate on his behalf um, because it was the relationship was just not working between him and the musicians. Um, this is also the time when Clara develops a close uh, friendship 
with um, Josef Joachim and also um, Johannes Brahms. He, Brahms shows up as a young guy um, at their Dusseldorf apartment, and he's, um, you know, he's an admirer of Robert Schumann's music and Clara Schumann too. He meets them, he plays a little bit of his music, and they're instantly um, enchanted and uh, excited and interested, uh, and they develop a, a very close relationship, the three of them there. And Robert just keeps getting worse, <laughs> is the theme at this point, to the point where he's actually, he actually asks and decides to go to um, the asylum uh, himself. And uh, Robert is ordered by doctors not to see Robert for both of their sakes. They insisted that it would be disastrous for him to see her. It would just um, make his condition worse. So um, he moves to a town called Endenich, um, not so far from Bonn. And um, Robert, I mean, Clara doesn't see him for years, um, about two years, two and a half years. Um, she does finally see him about two days before he dies. They call, him, call her in and say, the end is near, you should come. And um, at that point, he really can't move, he can't talk, um, which is just very traumatic to see. So Clara has to resume her concert life again and to provide for the family. And she performs pretty rigorously um, throughout the 1870s into her 50s. Um, she does take a permanent teaching position uh, eventually at a music conservatory in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, but by the time she's about 60 years old, Clara's finding that she needs about a week of rest between performances to be able to do the job uh, well. Um, so the teaching position is really appealing at this point in life because it gives her the ability to stay in one place and she's not putting so much wear and tear on her body. And she gives her final uh, public performance in 1891 at 72 years old, continues to play and teach um, for the final years um, until she dies at 76 years old in Frankfurt. And I'll, I, I will close just this recap of her life with um, uh, the final sentence of Nancy Reich's account of Clara's life. She said, as she lay dying, she asked her grandson Ferdinand to play for her. The music uh, from Schumann's Intermezzi, Opus 4, and his F-sharp major roman romance, uh, Opus 28, was the last she heard. Um, so that is a recap of, um, thank you for going on the journey with me, of a recap of Clara's life. I think that um, it's easy to sort of um, whittle her life down to a few sentences and talk about her father and talk about Robert and talk about Brahms. Um, but there's really so much that factors into what she was dealing with as a composer, as a performer, as a mother, as a wife, um, as a daughter, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to go over that. Now, okay. So what I want, want to do now is I'm going to come down and just sort of recap what I have on display for you. Um, and then invite you to come up and take time to look at it and ask questions. And, and I've, I'll open up for questions before that, too. Um, on this table over here, we have um, two editions of a uh, work by Robert Schumann, his impromptus, uh, based on a romance of Clara Wieck. So um, the first edition's from 1833, so they're quite young. Um, this is before he gets entangled with, with Clara and Wieck and the whole mess of everything. So uh, he actually dedicates uh, this work to Frederick Wieck. So you'll see it, it's in French, the first edition. He says, A Monsieur Frederick Wieck. Well, he republishes the work um, some decades later, af you know, after he's been through it. And um, he's so 
disgusted and angry with Veek that he takes away the dedication. So you'll notice when you look at the covers that there's, um, there's no dedication on the later edition. Uh, we have an edition of his, um, of, of Clara's variations on a theme of Robert Schumann, which was on the concert last night. It was, it was a stunning piece on the concert last night. And actually, um, what you'll find, and I can go into more detail, is that when you get to the end of the piece, Clara actually works in a th her theme, which Robert used as the basis of his impromptus um, over here. So for any of you who are advanced in reading musical no notation, I'll send you on a treasure hunt to see if you can find the theme. If not, I'll come over and, and we can talk about it and point it out. Um, but that's one example of Clara and Robert um, constantly you know, speaking each other, to each other through music and leaving messages for each other in the music as well. The letter that I mentioned earlier from her stay in Paris, her tour, um, uh, signed Clara Vick, and she's um, just making arrangements. She's reaching out to see if she can get on uh, touring or get performances um, arranged since her father wasn't there to do that for her. Next to it, we have a love letter from Robert to Clara um, that's from one of our collections. And I have a translation of it next to, uh, the, next to the letter so you can read what he's saying. Um, I, it's on the backside because you'll notice in the translation there's, um, there's uh, uh, writing in ink, that is Robert's writing, but then there's a response that Clara wrote in pencil. So the pencil is actually Clara's response to Robert, which you can read in the translation. It's very, the letter is very over the top and schmoopy. So um, the Liebesfrühling cycle that I described in detail here, we have um, a piece that was on the program last night um, on Einem Lichten Morgen, which is from her Opus 23 songs. Um, she, these are among the last pieces that she wrote and published um, uh, while she was in Dresden. She really did not compose after Robert, after Robert died. She doesn't really compose. She does take on an editing role um, with his music, though. The fugue that I described from the uh, William Bradbury Musical Autographs album the first edition of her piano trio, which was the closer la in last night's program. Um, and then over here, uh, if you were at last night's program, you, you might have seen this as well, but a lot of you weren't. So you'll have to come over here. This is actually a really cool set of uh, items I have out here. Um, Clara Schumann wrote her own cadenza to Mozart's D minor piano concerto. This was a pretty, co this is a common practice at this you know, time, Beethoven starts this tradition of writing your own uh, cadenza to insert into, um, into the concerto. So she wrote her own and we happen to have um, her rough draft. So you can see her working copy with revisions and, and her cross outs and everything. Um, we also have her fair copy, which is on this really pretty stationary with green um, decorative uh, work around it. It's really beautifully done, and that's sort of the clean copy, presentation copy that she could use. Now, we also have Brahms's cadenza for the same movement from the same concerto of Mozart's. And the reason I have it out is because as Clara was in old age and she was editing her stuff and she was looking back at her music, suddenly a light bulb went off in her head and she said, oh my gosh, this is practically Brahms's cadenza. Like I took so much of Brahms's stuff and put it into my cadenza. So she wrote back to Brahms or she wrote to Brahms right away and explained the situation and said, you know, should I give you credit or something in, in the publication? And Brahms and she were so deeply connected and they had such a um, rapport and he was such a gentleman. He said, of course not. You know, something along the lines of, if, if, if I had to give you credit for all of the melodies in my works that you've inspired, then, you know, I wouldn't be able to list them all or something like that. 
So um, in the end, they were all fine with it. But um, what I can point out, and my colleagues can point out, is that on the front side of Brahms's manuscript is actually a note from Clara Schumann in her hand indicating the parts of the cadenza that she identified she took from. <laughs> so, so this is um, a small display we have out here. Um, I want to give you time to come up. Does anybody have any questions right off the bat? And we, oh, and also um, my colleague will bring a microphone over so that um, it gets captured oh, and that people can hear. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for a very informative talk. Uh, I feel like I learned some key bits of information that really changed my perspective on Clara, so I appreciate that. Um, my question is about her mother. Mm -hmm. I was not aware that she was also a, an accomplished pianist and all that sort of thing, and I'm wondering how, what her relationship was like with her mother and how much the, the old kind of story of Vic being this taskmaster that made her be a, a virtuoso is balanced by her admiring her mother and wanting to be a virtuoso? Great question. So after she goes back to live with Friedrich when she's five, she really doesn't have contact with her mother uh, for a long time. I mean, she's not, they're not a part of each other's lives. But when she breaks with Friedrich, and she comes back from that Paris tour in 39, and she doesn't have a home to go live in in Leipzig. She goes to live with Marianne in Berlin, and she reconnects with her mother. And um, I have not seen evidence of a huge musical influence from her mother over her, or admiration for that part of, of her mother's life. Um, but I do know that they maintained a closer connection over the rest of her life, and in fact, she would send some of her children to go live with her mother at times. That was one thing that Clara, I mean, when you have eight, or you have seven to eight children, um, they weren't all with her all the time. Uh, she would send them to boarding school or to go live with her mother, or uh, she had wet nurses for all of her babies, so. Yeah. Bonnie, oh, we'll get a microphone. Uh, thank you all for this uh, great three days of events. I want to um, bring something up uh, for the reasons of, it's been bothering me since the film on Thursday night. And we all know how uh, dangerous a narrative is that's repeated over and over again. Um, Schumann began studying piano with Friedrich Wieck in 1828, um, not in 1830 when he came down to live with them. Okay. In fact, he came to Leipzig initially um, to go to university there and was taking lessons there before he went to Heidelberg. Uh, so uh, he knew Clara, of course, before that. Uh -huh. uh, Nancy Reich, uh, I checked that out, um, says that he'd heard her um, in 1828 already when she okay. was nine. Um, when he did go to Heidelberg, that's when he developed the hand injury. I've been studying the hand injury, um, reading very closely in those source documents. He'd already been studying with Wieck and was inspired to practice too many hours a day. He records in his diary practicing seven hours a day, a bunch of etudes and then difficult repertoire and so on. So it's very likely that his hand injury began as overuse syndrome. And that's before he ever came down um, to study uh, in, in the Wieck household. Um, while he was in Heidelberg, he got his mother to write the letter to Friedrich Wieck. Uh, and Wieck writes back to his mother saying, of course, he can make Schumann a, a great pianist in three years if he comes and takes a lesson with him every day. Right. But he'd already been a student of Wieck's for some time. That's how Wieck knew his capacities. And you know, so in no way was Robert Schumann a new student when he came to, to Leipzig to live in the Wieck household in 1830. Oh, good. That's a great clarification. Robertification, not a clarification. Clar clarification, yes. 
We've been throwing that joke around this week, too. <laughs> I saw your hand, yes. So thank you for the clarification with regard to wet nurses and 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 having the the mother be the care provider, et cetera. Because I've always wondered, did she bring her children along? I mean, I don't, you know, I had one child and traveled with my child. I can't imagine eight <laughs> children. Um, with regard to the hand injury, I recall from visiting the Schumann House in Leipzig, it was because he had he had put together this contraption for his hand that he thought would exercise his fingers better and it did the exact opposite. So that's, that's so, well, I, you know, I, I, I am an amateur here. I know nothing. All I know is that I'm visiting that house. Um, and then with regard to um, the composing going better or worse depending on her playing schedule, um, for, when I visited the Bond house, it was my understanding that when he was composing, he forbid her from playing and practicing. So Well, they only had one piano for right. most of their... Right. Until they moved to Dusseldorf. That was when she got her own piano. Right. And had the, the, right. the space and the right. ability yeah. to... Yeah. To work yeah. independently. Yeah. So, and then finally, I received an email last night that, according to some BBC um, popularity contest, um, that she is now number one in popularity of all the concert music um, composers, um, to include Beethoven. Uh, Bach, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And could you speak on that? And where can I actually find that? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, um, I know what you're talking about, and I might have to enlist my colleague to help me with the explanation because I, I sort of heard this in passing. I believe it was, I don't want to use the word a joke, but I believe it was a planned um, uprising to yeah james can you uh, speak on that poll yeah that was done by cbc a bbc account and there was a there was a group of musicologists who followed this account saying let's all vote for clara and it was a it was a a, a kind of planned campaign and it, and they said well you know bach is going to be fine what we need to do is promote the music of Clara Schumann because she's the only person on this list that isn't performed as often as the others. And so it was a concerted effort of other musicologists on Twitter to kind of get that to happen. And so that, that was what it was. It was kind of a planned uh, political statement in a certain way on this Twitter poll. And then it made, of course, news beyond that. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you, James. Hi. James was the one who told me about that in passing <laughs> at work. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, I had a quick question. Um, you had mentioned about Friedrich and Clara having a final break. So what ended up happening with Friedrich? Did they ever reconcile at all? Or? Um, Friedrich had moved. He, as I said, he had moved to Dresden. Um, I don't know very many details of what happened to Friedrich after that point, let's see, my, let me remind myself. He dies in 1873, um, so a good 23 years before she does. So she's in her 50s and so, um, I, I don't know that, I'm not aware that they really reconnected. I mean, they did have a brief reconciliation, um, but I don't think it really lasted or, or was meaningful. Any other questions for now? Yes, um, I can show you quickly some. Um, okay, so they're children. Um, actually, so Marie is the eldest, and she studied piano with Clara, and actually was something of an assistant to Clara. Uh, throughout her life, um, she was probably, she was closest to her mother. Um, Elise was the second eldest. 
Um, Julie was the third eldest. Um, these are both pictures of Julie. Uh, Julie was sort of regarded as the, um, maybe the, the most charming, the most attractive daughter of the, of, of the Schumann children. She actually ends up marrying an Italian count who, it, they have a beautiful marriage and he loves her so much. Um, the story is that after Brahms found out that she was engaged, he was um, heartbroken uh, because apparently he had had deep feelings for Julie, which was kind of awkward for Clara and Clara didn't love that <laughs> dynamic. <laughs> um, but Julie actually is only married for about three years before she dies. Um, a lot of the children had uh, poor health situations. Ludwig and Ferdinand are the next. They're um, the first boys. Um, Ludwig ends up in a mental um, institution as well at a young age. That's pretty uh, traumatic. Uh, Ferdinand actually fights in the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, and then he has a family. Um, but he becomes addicted to morphine. And Ferdinand gets to a point where he is not able to provide for his family. And Clara actually takes on responsibilities of caring for her grandchildren. Um, she, wants, she says, I will help financially, but I want some control over what's going on with them. And uh, so one of his sons, also named Ferdinand, is the Ferdinand I referred to at the very end of her life who plays music for her. He studied piano with her and, um, and uh, Marie. And then um, Eugenie, uh, another girl, and then Felix, that final picture is of Felix. He was the youngest. He also had a relatively short life. Um, he died at 18, or I'm sorry, he didn't die at 18. He died in his 20s, maybe 23, I think. And um, he was a poet, and he had all of these literary and musical gifts and really wanted to um, pursue that. And Clara tried to squash that as much as she could, but then gave into it and um, sent some of his poems to Brahms. And Brahms ended up setting a couple of his poems uh, to music. So you can, I like Mein Liebe ist Grün. That's my favorite of the, of the Felix poems that he set. And one of her uh, children died at 16 months too. So, um, so there were, and her brothers, I should also say, her, uh, one of her brothers would, taught piano, another one um, was involved with making pianos or selling pianos, I can't remember. So there were other musical connections in the family, um, but nobody who followed in her footsteps exactly. Any other questions? One more? So I'm wondering about the pregnancies and her performances, because I'm also Me researching <laughs> a woman who um, was a performer and through six pregnancies. Do you have any more precise information about how long a pregnant woman could appear on a stage and still... And uh, still do it? St well, or not, not from her point of view, but from the public's point of view, ah. that, that they would accept that somebody that's a that's a fantastic question yeah um i would my first inclination would be to go back to nancy reich's yeah. book and look at the dates more specifically and think about how far along she was at the yeah. certain at yeah. various points and there are so many pregnancies to keep yeah. track of huh. um but i know that she performed pretty far into her pregnancies in yeah. cert at, at least certain pregnancies of hers uh -huh. Um, yeah, okay. she, thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks. Sure. Kate. <laughs> okay. So I think now what we'll do is, um, invite you to come up and take a closer look at the materials. Please, um, don't turn pages yourself, but if you would like a page turn, I, or one of my, um, colleagues will be more than happy to help you out with that and um, feel free to come up and ask other questions. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for learning a little bit more about one of my favorite people. So, thank you. <laughs>